Hello, I'm Christian Lutzenitz. I'm a senior lecturer in Tibetan and Buddhist art at Source University of London. And I wanted to introduce a small uh, publication that we recently did. That means I, together with Markus Fiebeck from the University of Vienna. Uh, it's a joint publication on two illuminated text collections of a monastery in Mustang called Namgyal Monastery. And uh, these collections are rather unusual in the sense that they are uh, illuminated throughout the volumes uh, of the two texts, or text collections, and uh, that for the Sutra collection we have the earliest example, uh, at least at that date, of a kind of illuminated program that was uh, essentially uh, thought of to be distributed uh, over 30 volumes. Uh, the manuscripts that we found in, in uh, Mustang uh, were a kind of chance find uh, in, in a way that because many monasteries have uh, old texts, many have illuminations, but in this case uh, the fact that so many of them are preserved and that both text collections are fairly complete uh, kind of triggered uh, us to, to write this publication. Uh, it also gives a broader context about uh, the development of Tibetan manuscripts in general and uh, also on the way how you recognize early uh, Tibetan manuscripts. So. There are kind of two aspects to it. On the one hand, Marcus Feedback wrote on the, on the, the aspect of, of the textual uh, side of, of things, which relate to the so-called Kanjo studies, namely how the, the Tibetan canon developed and how you can see this development on the basis of handwritten manuscripts uh, brought together. And so much of the analysis uh, concerns this this aspect of it, uh, the handwritten aspect, but also the different uh, text titles and how they are distributed across the volume, uh, which ones are included in the Sutra volume and so on, that give us a good idea of where this particular collection stands in the historical development of uh, Tibetan Buddhist canonical literature. Uh, and the other important aspect that I worked on uh, were the illuminations. And in this case, what we have, and I can just show an example here, uh, we have uh, volume Cha, uh, the seventh volume of the Sutra collection. And in this case, we'll publish the entire folio and then the, the two illuminations, which in this case show uh, two of the previous lives of the Buddha. And so when I talk about the illumination program, uh, it means that uh, at the beginning we have the previous lives of the Buddha, then the life of the Buddha, then Im important deities, Buddhist deities, starting with Buddha, uh, Bodhisattvas, and so on. And uh, then uh, towards the end of the manuscript, we also have uh, Padmasambhava uh, for the the Nyingma teachings coming into the school uh, that created uh, those manuscripts. But each of the, uh, the volumes is presented by the first page, then the actual catalogue of the texts, and then the last page where again there are two illuminations. And so the fact that, that there were four illuminations distributed across each volume kind of constitutes that program that ends with several folios that are interesting insofar as they also show the donors, <laughs> uh, which uh, gives us an insight into the, the, the uh, context, the cultural context of the time as well which in this case probably indicates that they were uh, the product of small Buddhist communities kind of centered around charismatic teachers 
with a few monks around them. And that seems to be the, the situation in Lower Mustang, where the Sutra collection was probably uh, made while uh, the, the first text collection studied is uh, 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 the longest uh, version of the Prajnaparamita, uh, the Shatasahasrika Prajnaparamita. And in this case, the program is not entirely uh, kind of thought through, it's more a succession of uh, Buddhas and Bodhisattvas that are uh, represented with only the last illuminations relating to the text itself, uh, namely uh, giving the story of, of the Bodhisattva Sadhaparudita in search of the perfection of wisdom. So the, the publication overall is thus, uh, on the one hand, a good introduction into the development of the Tibetan Buddhist canonical literature, how to recognize old manuscripts and so on. And on the other hand, uh, uh, a glimpse into the visual culture of the time, uh, which is uh, mostly the late 13th and early 14th century. It's about uh, IG Monastery, a very important monument uh, in uh, present-day Ladakh. Uh, in my opinion, it should be a World Heritage Site uh, on the fact uh, that it preserves uh, several monuments that go straight back to the late 12th, early 13th century and are a document of uh, the transmission of uh, Buddhism from India to Tibet. Uh, Aichi is very interesting. It's a relatively small place. Uh, that has a, a, a monastic complex that is called the Choskor. And within the Choskor, there is a small assembly hall, a three-storied temple, there are several painted stupas and other temples. And uh, only the Sumzak, the most famous building, the three-storied temple, was published previously in any detail. Uh, more recently, there is also another publication that uh, offers more photography of the site, but not much information about its content. And so the goal of this publication was really to present all the monuments of Alci and think about the, the, the historical context within which uh, they were established. And I think one, there, there are two important aspects to that. Uh, one is, uh, as we can reconstruct today, Alci was probably founded as a family monument. So as the monument of uh, uh, the so-called Zhou family that moved to West Tibet from Central Tibet and established itself in the area of Lower Ladakh. Uh, more precisely in Sunda, as we know from an inscription, and they established the monument at a lower location than, than their own place, uh, presumably bef because of the, the perfect climate and the protection the place itself uh, afforded. Uh, and so the monuments are relatively small. Another important aspect is that the, they probably imported uh, the painters from Kashmir. And uh, so much of the wall paintings that we find are uh, miniature paintings on the walls uh, with uh, very refined details that reflect uh, the culture of Kashmir of that time. Uh, this is particularly obvious on, on the dress of one of the bodhisattvas where the temples of Kashmir apparently are depicted. Uh, but the interesting as or an interesting aspect about the publication or, and the site as a whole is that while it is very clearly a local production of Ladakh, history, uh, local tradition uh, favors an earlier interpretation or an interpretation that attributes the monument to Rinchen Sangpo, famous translator from West Tibet, uh, about 200 years 
before the actual founding of Alci. And it's this tradition that uh, kind of keeps, uh, is still very strong within the region. So uh, while the book itself is really more about the monuments and how to read the monuments and what they contain and uh, the kind of historical uh, linkages of what they contain. It also contains uh, three-dimensional plans of the site as well as all the temples uh, and uh, yeah, extensive lists, for example, of uh, the deities that are represented. Among others, it also represents uh, Alci uh, also represents a repository of Hindu iconography in the form of, of uh, Hindu and Pan-Indian deities converted uh, to Buddhism and then depicted in the wall, wall paintings accordingly. Uh, so altogether, I hope that this kind of more comprehensive study of the site uh, that sooner or later will also be available online uh, with uh, the pictorial material uh, accompanied it, uh, that, that that kind of establishes a more precise history of the site and shows uh, the cultural context in which it developed.